Greetings, everyone. Welcome back into Calc 1. Time to take a sidestep for a moment and talk about a review for exam two. So what I'm gonna do is work out several examples from previous tests that I've given in old semesters. And uh, I'm gonna use them for you uh, as examples for you so that you can get an idea of what one of these tests usually looks like. As I always say, and I always warn with these reviews, remember, you should focus on whether or not you're getting the overall skills and not the individual examples. Don't memorize patterns. Understand the structure and the skill that it takes to put these things together. Pause me sometimes and see if you can get a little bit ahead of me since you've already learned these things and this is just a review. Right, it's, it's good to be able to, to uh, push yourself a little bit. Okay, so just remember that. So, Calculus 1, Exam 2 Review. What we're gonna be talking about are the rules, the shortcuts, right, for differentiation. And those entail all of the basic ones, which is power rule, all of the trig rules, your exponent and log rules, uh, inverse trig rules, things like that all of those basic singular function rules that you should know quickly so that you can get through these problems uh, efficiently, right? Then you have your structural rules, which are your product rule, quotient rule, chain rule, and then of course the advanced structures of using them implicitly or using them in an inverse fashion. Those are all under the basic rules of differentiation. Okay, then the rest are how we can apply the derivative to certain uh, objectives. For one, of course, the main one, we use derivatives as a rate of change where we can either measure some rates, maybe with some velocities or maybe with some sort of change in a, a, a production of something, who knows? Or we can also use them to find horizontal and vertical tangencies uh, in, in our functions. <clears throat> then of course, there's related rates where you're uh, having some formula that we're going to use implicit differentiation on and we are finding extrema on closed intervals, so you'll be given some closed interval of some function and it's continuous on that interval, and we'll be finding the maximum and minimum uh, of the function there. And then lastly, mean value theorem. One of the biggest, uh, most important rules that we use a lot in several different levels of calculus, uh, the, uh, being able to determine when an average and an instantaneous have the same value uh, in rates of change, right? So the mean value theorem. Um, I hope this test examples help you in your studying endeavors. Let's begin with some examples of using the derivative rules, the shortcut rules, the rules that allow us to efficiently find derivative functions of more complicated uh, original functions. Okay, so find the derivative. I've got b of x here is equal to the log log, not the ln log, and that's important, right? It's base 10 here, not base e. Log of 7x over x plus 4. So I'm going to work this one two different ways to show you how you can easily get wrapped up in these structures and forget that algebra sometimes is your friend. So the obvious way, the way that looks you know, right up at front is that I'm gonna do the logarithm derivative and then I'll have a chain rule of the function on the inside, which is gonna cause me to chain a quotient rule, right? Because this is a quotient and it's inside of the outer function there. Okay, so my derivative b prime here would then be equal to one over this but be careful right this wasn't ln it's log base 10 so I need to multiply that times 1 over ln of 10 because of that extra multiplication factor there then times the derivative of the inside function which is going to be a, a quotient rule. So that's low d high, so that's x plus 4, right, times 7, minus high d low, 
which is just 7x times 1 over square of low. So that's x plus 4 squared, like so. Okay, so then I can simplify uh, some of this. B prime then is the reciprocal of this is just x plus 4 over 7x. And I'll go ahead and say times the ln 10 right here, like that. Then times this fraction right here. But I want you to notice I'm going to have a 7x and a minus 7x. So those are going to wipe out, leaving me with just the 28. And then the x plus 4 quantity squared. I have an x plus 4 here and two of them down here. So I can reduce those. And then the 28 and the 7 here can also reduce right, leaving me with the four. So in my uh, all together here, b prime of x is gonna be equal to four over, I have x ln 10, uh, and then times x plus four. So to make that a little bit easier to read, I'm gonna do x, x plus four, ln 10. Or if you want, you could do one over ln 10 uh, out front, okay? So just a quick recap, what I did was the outside derivative, which is one over the inside, and the one over ln 10 is because the base was not ln, it was not base e, it was base 10, it was base something else. So you have to do that fix, uh, fix it step. And then um, the inside derivative is a chain rule. But after I chain that, I notice it's a fraction, I did a quotient rule, and then everything after that was simplifying the algebra leading me to this derivative right here. So this is my b prime of x. Now how could I have used algebra to make this particular problem a little bit nicer on myself? Well here's what I could have done. I could have noticed that b of x could be rewritten using my log rules. Okay, so I have log of 7 times x and then divided by x plus 4. So that's log of 7 plus log of x minus the log of x plus 4. Now that the logarithms are separated out, each one of these is a quick uh, derivative rule in and of itself where no real chain rules are needed. Okay, so then b prime of x is going to be equal to 0, right, because log of 7 is just a number, plus 1 over x, because that's just the log of x, but be careful, times 1 over ln 10, minus 1 over x plus 4, and again, base 10, so it's 1 over ln 10. Okay, so just a little bit of algebra here. Notice they both have the 1 over ln 10. So I have that I can just factor out. Times, and I have 1 over x minus 1 over x plus 4. So if you do a little bit of common denominator work here, you'll notice that what I'm going to end up with is uh, x plus 4 minus x over x times x plus 4 because I'm just going to multiply by x plus 4 here and I'm going to multiply by x here but notice x and minus x will reduce and this is exactly leaving me in the same spot uh, as up above. I have the ln 10 in the denominator times x and x plus 4 and I'm left with a a 4 in the numerator. So you'll see it's the exact same result. I'm ending up with 4 over x, x plus 4. Ooh, that's yucky. Times ln 10 in the denominator there. Or like I said before, you can keep the 1 over ln 10 separate if that makes you more comfortable. Okay, so just an example of how you can easily get wrapped up in these rules and structures and forget, hey, I could make this algebraically simpler 
and the calculus will be simpler. All of the intermittent steps afterwards will be simpler, okay? Or if you prefer something more, you know, all at once, you can go that way too. Next, I have psi of P is equal to four secant cubed pi P minus two. Okay, now remember, secant is a function, but so is cubed. And the pi P minus two is inside of the secant, and the secant is inside of the cube. Remember with trigonometry, if you have an exponent here, it's actually shorthand for the cube is really on all of this. So this should be thought of like this, right? This whole thing is cubed like this, okay? So now the, the psi derivative, right? We'll be doing uh, d psi dp essentially, right? Or you could write psi prime of p any way you want to look at it. The, the four is along for the ride. And then I've got a double chain rule here, a double nested chain rule. I've got a function inside of a function inside of a function, right? So I'm gonna start with the most outside. That'll be times three because of a power rule. And I'll have everything on the inside of that is going to remain the same but just to a lower power. Times, now I have to start chaining. The derivative of secant is secant tangent. Now, what goes inside of these? Pi, P minus two, and then tangent, same thing. Pi, P minus two. I know I'm squishing it in there a little bit here. Let's, uh, let's make some space here for myself. tangent pi p minus 2. Okay? Now wait, we're not done. We have done the two of the nested chains, right? Two of them so far. So what's next? What's left? Well, now I have to do the derivative of the pi p minus 2, right? Just, to, just for space sakes, I'm just going to uh, squeeze it in right here, uh, times pi. Okay, so notice I did the cube first, right? Drop the 3, minus 1. I still have that at same inside. The derivative of secant is the secant times the tangent of the same argument. So notice they both still have the pi p minus 2 because that hasn't had its turn yet. And then the derivative of pi p minus 2 is the pi, because remember p is our actual input variable, right, our, our independent variable there. Okay, so all together, d psi dp is equal to, I've got 12 pi, and then notice I've got secant squared times another secant. So that's just secant cubed pi p minus 2 and times tangent pi p minus 2 and there you have it it's kind of weird to see right that a, a secant cubed to begin with ends up with that same secant cubed in the derivative right but it's just the way the the, the trig rules work <clears throat> okay and lastly I have the uh, 2 e to the negative 8t times arc sine of 3t minus 1. Okay, now let's talk about the different pieces here. Okay, so I have lambda of t, and I'm noticing that what this is is a product, right? Notice right away that I have one function times another function, okay? So my overall structure is a product rule. However, I've also got a slight bit of chain rule in there too, right? Because the negative 8t is going to have his own derivative, and the 3t minus 1 is going to have his own derivative as well. But we're going to set up the product here. 
okay? So I've got the uh, lambda prime of t is gonna be equal to, and remember, I'm gonna have four spots, right? I'm gonna have four spots. I'm gonna have the, uh, if I have the different pieces here, let's uh, label them with letters we haven't used yet here. We haven't used F and G. So if I say this is F right here and this is G right here, right? Then I'm gonna have uh, F prime times G plus F times G prime. Okay, so let's do that. Lambda prime of T is gonna be equal to F prime. So two E to the negative eight T. Remember, an exponential is his own derivative, so I'll still have e to the negative 8t. The 2 is along for the ride, but I've also got the inside derivative of negative 8. So I end up with a negative 16 e to the negative 8t. And the rest of it is the same as up here. I still have arc sine 3t minus 1 plus. Now f is going to be left alone. That's 2 e to the negative 8t, g prime. Now I need to do a derivative of inverse sine. Remember the derivative of inverse sine is 1 over square root of 1 minus x squared, right? But I'm not x right now, I have 3t minus 1. So that's going to be 3t minus 1 quantity squared inside of that radical. And then I have to invoke a chain rule because that was inside of my derivative. The derivative of 3t minus 1, I'll put times 3. Okay, so let's um, bring this together as much as possible here. Uh, I can do just a little bit of factoring. To make the plus and minus signs a little bit cleaner, I'm going to factor a negative. They both have a 2 and they both have e to the negative 8t. Okay, now you don't have to do the negative, I'm just doing that to make the, um, the, the, the thing in front not be negative. So I'm left with 8 arc sine of 3t minus 1, minus, because remember I factored a negative, okay? If you didn't want to factor the negative, then it would be negative in front of the 8 and positive right here, but whichever way uh, makes you more comfortable. I'm gonna have three here because I took all of this. So I have three over square root of one minus three T minus one quantity squared. And of course you could do some other small minor things like maybe you could multiply out the three T minus one squared and combine it with the one. Um, it's not really gonna clean anything up for you so really and honestly, I would just leave this derivative uh, in this yuck fest form uh, right there. Now let's move up to more usage of the derivative rules. Um, we're going to do some second derivatives, which is basically the same idea, right? You just have to do a derivative of a derivative. Okay, so in each one of these, I'll have to find the first derivative first and then the second derivative second in the name, right? Okay, so find the second derivative of f of x equals tangent of pi x. Okay, so again, I'll have to find first derivative. So f prime of x is equal to, this is a chain rule right here. The derivative of tangent is secant squared, and then the inside stays the same. And then of course, the inside derivative is pi, so I'll have to say times pi. Um, you could write this a little bit more efficiently as just pi secant squared pi x, right? Next, I want to take the derivative of this, which is very similar to one that we've just done a moment ago, and that would be the second derivative, f double prime of x which is then going to be the pi is along for the ride. This, remember, the squared is on the outside of the secant. So I'm gonna do that first. I'm gonna have two times secant to the one of 
pi x. And then the secant was inside of the squared. So I'll do a chain rule of him as well, which is going to give me a secant of pi x times the tangent of pi x. And then lastly, the inside derivative again of pi is going to land me uh, with another times pi. Okay, so let's bring it all together. Second derivative of f of x, f double prime of x is equal to, I have two pi times pi, so that's two pi squared. I have two secants, so secant of pi x squared tangent pi x. So there's my second derivative of tangent of pi x. Okay, now k of x is equal to negative 2x over 6x plus 5. My first derivative here, immediately you can see, requires a quotient rule. So I'll start there. Uh, dk dx is equal to and yeah, I know, I, I switch between the prime and the, and the differential formats here just to get some variety and so you can see that they are equivalent here. Okay, so anyway, dk dx, quotient rule, uh, low d high, so that's going to be uh, 6x plus 5 times negative 2 minus high d low, so that's negative 2x times 6 over square of below. So 6x plus 5 squared. Okay, so let's multiply that out and simplify it a bit. Uh, I'm going to get a negative 12x minus 10, and then double negative, so plus 6 times 2x is 12x, and my denominator is still the 6x plus 5 quantity squared. And of course, minus 12x plus 12x, those are both gone. And you can see that what I'm left with is the negative 10 over the quantity 6x plus 5 squared. Since I want to do another derivative, right, it's tempting to leave it this way and say, oh, I'll just do another quotient rule again. Yes, but you can actually save yourself a little bit of heartache on this one because I can rewrite this with just a power rule. This is equivalent to negative 10 times 6x plus 5 to the negative 2 power. And then once you write it like this, it's just one chain rule away uh, from a quick derivative. So my second derivative, d squared k dx squared, remember that's how we symbolize second derivative, like I have d over dx twice applied to k. So then that gives me negative 2 times the negative 10. I'll just go ahead and write it out. 6x plus 5 to the negative 3. That's my outer part of the chain rule. That was just a power rule. Times the inside derivative of 6, because the derivative of 6x plus 5. So altogether, my second derivative is equal to uh, 120 times the quantity 6x plus 5 to the negative 3. Or if you wish, you could go ahead and revert back to the fractional format uh, with it written like this. Either one of those last two are perfectly acceptable uh, second derivative formats here. Now let's begin the applications of derivatives. We can use derivatives to find points where a graph has horizontal and vertical tangency. And we can also use it to find equations of lines that are tangent. So I have two very good sample problems here in those particular fields. So I have an equation here, and I'm hoping that you realize exactly what type of equation it is. Sort of little details like that always help you when you're approaching these problems. If you, if you remember some structures of some basic things, it doesn't even have to be a calculus structure. In this case, it's an algebraic structure of a circle, right? X minus H squared, Y minus K squared, uh, and equal to R squared. So you can tell that this is a circle centered at 3, negative 4. 
with a radius of five. So if you think to yourself, circle, right? Then you, uh, you should realize that just the graph of a circle should have two horizontal tangents here and here, and it should have two vertical tangents here and here. Okay? Now remember, circles don't pass a vertical line test, and that's okay. We're not necessarily needing to do derivatives involving a direct function per se. Uh, later on in calculus, you learn of ways to make shapes like this uh, into something that we can use as a function. But regardless, I don't have to have it as a, a, a point blank, well-defined function in order to do this kind of calculation. I can use implicit differentiation to find the, uh, the derivative here and then very quickly identify where vertical and horizontal tangencies are. So to do just that, I am going to take a derivative with respect to x d over dx of the whole thing. That's going to be my implicit differentiation here. Okay? Now, of course, the, the differential separates across addition and subtraction. So I'll be doing the derivative of just this piece, the derivative of just this piece, and just this one as well. And that is going to result in, since it's a derivative with respect to x, the, the, the part with the x doesn't need anything special other than just your normal rule. So it's a power rule. I drop the 2, and I'm left with the inside to the 1 power. Derivative of the inside is 1. Plus, same, same setup. I have a power rule, 2 times leave the inside alone to the 1 power. But now I'm taking the derivative of the y plus 4 and it's a derivative with respect to x. The derivative of the 4 is 0, but the derivative of y is dy dx. So my chain rule there demands that I put times dy dx, hence the implicit differentiation fill in here. And then, of course, derivative of a constant is 0. So at this point right here, one thing that I could see right away is I could divide everything by 2. Right? This term, this term, and this term, I could just divide everything by 2, and it'll make everything simpler for me. Uh, so I have x minus 3 times 1 as itself, of course, to the 1 power is still itself, uh, plus y plus 4 times dy dx is equal to 0. Now, I didn't need the parentheses here, and that's going to help me avoid some uh, issues with negative signs in a minute. And then I did need the parentheses here because of the times dy dx. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add 3 and subtract x. So 0 plus 3 is 3, and of course subtracting x gives me a minus x. And then I'm just going to divide both sides by y plus 4. So notice that dy over dx in this case is equal to 3 minus x divided by y plus 4. Okay, so I've got my derivative. Now the next step, how to use that to notice where I have uh, vertical and horizontal tangencies. Well remember, a uh, horizontal uh, tangent is going to happen anytime the derivative is zero, right? Horizontal tangent, derivative equals zero. Vertical tangents, these are going to happen in special cases of derivative being undefined, right? There's a, there's a lot of different places where the derivative can be undefined, but here's the thing. You know that this is a circle, so you know it has a continuous domain from one side to the other, okay? And from the uh, continuous range from the bottom to the top. So my undefined derivatives are not going to come from asymptotes or breaks of any kind, okay? My only derivative undefined spots, therefore the only kind that are left, are these vertical tangents. 
So it helps to know some information about this structure beforehand. Well, right here, this fraction is easy to determine where both of these locations are. The derivative is going to equal zero when the top is zero. That means this right here tells me that I'm gonna have a horizontal tangency, right? When x is equal to three. And this piece right here, y plus four, is in the denominator. So I'm going to have a division by zero, which is an undefined, any time y is four. Therefore, I can have a vertical tangency any time y is negative four. Okay, now of course, the, both of these occurrences, these two different occurrences, can happen multiple places. If I let x equal 3, letting x equal 3, notice in the original equation here, x equaling 3 will zero out this piece, which is going to tell me y plus 4 squared is equal to 25. Okay, so this, I'll separate them here. This piece right here, implies that y plus 4 quantity squared is 25, which tells me y plus 4 is plus or minus 5. When I take the square root, don't forget, uh, I have plus and minus. So then this gives me that y is either going to be negative 4 plus 5, which is 1, or negative 4 minus 5, which is negative 9. Okay, well, I just got two points out of that. I got the point, uh, my horizontal tangents are going to be the points 3 comma 1 and 3 comma negative 9. Those are my horizontal tangent points. Next, my vertical tangent points, right? Those are going to come from when y is negative 4. And again, notice that's going to zero this piece out. So that implies that x minus 3 squared is equal to 25, which means x minus 3 is equal to plus or minus 5. When you take the square root, you get your plus or minus. So I add 3, right? 3 plus 5 is 8. 3 minus 5 is negative 2. So therefore, my vertical tangent points, right? The points where I get a vertical tangent line is going to be the points 8, negative 4 and negative 2, negative 4. Remember, this is a y value, the negative 4, right? And I found two x's. So I found these are my two vertical tangent points, right? <coughs> So that's what it was asking for. Find the points where these things occur. <clears throat> okay, so real quick, why don't you go take a look at um, this GeoGebra that I can show you real quick. Uh, we'll, see, we'll look at the graph and you'll see that these four points are indeed uh, where those things occur. Okay, so here's the graph of that circle with the equation x minus 3 squared plus y plus 4 squared is equal to 25. And the, the thing you need to notice is just exactly the answers that we came up with before. The horizontal tangency points are here at 3, 1, and here at 3, negative 9. And then the vertical tangency points are here at negative 2, negative 4 and 8 negative 4 those were the points that we listed before and you can see that those are actually the um, the vertical and horizontal tangency points for example the horizontal is like y equals 1 you can see it's a horizontal tangent line and uh, y equals negative 9 would be the other and then x equals negative 2 and x equals 8.
And those are the only ones that are found there. Okay, next, let's talk about an equation of a tangent line. Okay, but of course, it's not just finding the equation of a tangent line. Look at the function. I have a variable in a base and a variable in an exponent. This isn't just a simple basic rule for derivatives. I'm going to need to use logarithmic differentiation to do this particular derivative. And then I've got a particular point to use. And then I've got an equation to create of a line. Remember, for a line, I just need a slope and a point. Well, I've already got half of a point, x equals 4. And then I'm going to find the slope from the derivative. So here I go. I'm going to start by saying c of x is equal to y. Right? It's easier to deal with y than the c of x. Or if you want, you can leave it as c. Right? Uh, I'm going to use y, though. I'm going to take the ln of both sides. So natural log of y is equal to, and I'm going to use one of my logarithm rules. If I have a logarithm of the 5x to the x minus 4, I can take the power out. And that th this right here is the reason that you want to do this, because I want to separate the two variables. And logarithms have that ability to take an exponent away from the base momentarily, right? And that's what this logarithm has done. It's brought the exponent out. So now there's a multiplication between these two, and I can just treat it like a product rule. Okay, so now when I'm at this point right here, I'm going to use um, implicit differentiation, which means I'm going to apply an x derivative to the whole thing, right? So to this whole equation right here, d dx taking the derivative of this whole thing. So then when I take the x derivative with respect to something with a y, it's going to cause a chain rule. Outside derivative of ln is just going to be 1 over y times. And then the derivative of y is, of course, dy dx. Right? Or y prime, whichever one you prefer. And then over here, I've got a product rule. I've got two functions multiplied, and I'm going to do my derivative of this product rule. Okay, so derivative of the x minus 4 is, of course, 1. And then I leave the ln alone. Then plus leave the x minus 4 alone, and I do the derivative of the ln of 5x. Well, that's going to be... 1 over 5x, but then a chain rule, derivative of 5x is 5, like so. Okay, so let's clean it up a bit. First thing to notice is I really just want dy dx. So what I'm going to do is multiply by y over 1, or in other words, I'm just going to multiply by y to both sides. So I've got dy over dx is equal to and I'm going to put y times, because I multiplied y to both sides. 1 times the ln, of course, is the ln of 5x. Okay? Notice here the 5s eliminate, and I'm left with just 1 over x. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to distribute that 1 over x to both of these. So 1 over x times x is 1, and 1 over x times negative 4 is minus 4 over x, like so. Okay, I multiplied times y here, though. So instead of saying times y, what am I really multiplying here? Well, y is equal to 5x to the x minus 4. So times 5x to the x minus 4 power. And there we have it. There's my derivative, okay? I have this times the original function is my actual derivative here. Okay, next I'm interested in a particular derivative value at x equals 4. And then I also need uh, a particular value, uh, the y value at x equals 4. So I need two things, right, uh, from the x equals 4. So let's start right here. d 
dy over dx is c prime of x, right? This right here, this whole piece, this is c prime of x, okay? So what I'm interested in is c prime of 4. That means I'm going to let x be 4. So I have the ln of 5 times 4 is 20, plus 1 minus 4 divided by 4 is 1. 5 times 4 is 20 to the 4 minus 4 is 0 power. Okay, plus 1 minus 1, those add to 0. 20 to the 0 power is also times 1. So what do I end up with? C prime of 4 is just the ln of 20. Okay. What else do I need? I need a y value, right? So x equaling 4 here, this implies that y is going to be just C of 4, right? The function value at 4. Well, what is that? 5 times 4 is 20, and then 4 minus 4 is 0. 20 to the 0 power is 1. So I have a y value of 1 when x is 4. Okay? So in other words, I want to create a line. Okay? I'm creating a line where my slope, m, is equal to the ln of 20. And I have a point of 4, 1. Right? That's where the that's where the function is. I know that kind of looks like a nine. Let me redo that one. Four comma one. Well, I'm just going to use point slope formula here. This is just the equation of a line, just like you would in algebra. Right? Y minus the y value, which is one, equals m, which is ln of twenty, times x minus the x value, which is four. I'm going to distribute the ln 20, and then I'm going to add the 1. So y equals x ln 20 minus 4 ln 20 plus 1. Now I know it's, it's, it looks a little bit backwards. You're used to seeing mx plus b, and this is xm. But remember, with logarithms, we tend to write things in front of LNs so that they don't get confused. I don't want this to look like the LN of 20x, uh, although technically it would take parentheses to do that, I realize, but this is clearer and easier to see. And notice it's still a line because I have y equals x is to the 1 power times a number, minus, and this whole thing, this calculation is my quote unquote b, my y-intercept, right? I would do LN of 20, multiply by negative 4, and then add it to 1. Okay, so this is the equation of that tangent line. But don't just take my word for it, right? Go take a look at the GeoGebra on your way out. So here's that function, y equals 5x all to the x minus 4 power. And what we attempted to do and what we succeeded in doing was calculating uh, the the slope and then eventually also creating the tangent line so notice it does actually have the point that we talked about right here which is the point 4 1 so x equals 4 is at that point and then the tangent line is exactly the as you can see it right here is exactly what we had typed or what I had written on the board is x ln 20 uh, and then minus 4 ln 20 and plus 1. And you can see that that is the tangent line to this point here on the graph. No matter how much you zoom in, it's, you can see it stays tangent to the whole thing. More applications! Find the absolute extrema of the function k of x on this particular interval. Okay? So it's key to notice that the interval that we're defining this on is a closed interval, right? So we have that rule that says if a function is continuous on a closed interval, then it can only have, uh, it, or it must have an absolute max and an absolute min, and they can only happen at endpoints 
or critical uh, points, right? So we have the closed interval. How do we know it's continuous on there? Well, let's look at the domain of the K function here. The domain of X is everything, right? So then really it's just this logarithm part right here that might restrict the domain. And it does, okay? The domain of K right here is as long as this logarithm acts on a strictly positive number. Can't have zero, can't have negative. So two minus two would be zero, right? Three minus two would be one. Notice all I need is for x to be greater than two. That's gonna be our domain. So in other words, x would be two to infinity, right? Okay, so from that, I can assume that it is completely continuous, right? We have that, uh, that other little side note that uh, if a function uh, has a particular domain and it is uh, continuous on that domain, right? Then it's all connected and all the pieces are there. So I have this connected continuous interval. It's closed and this function is continuous on that. Okay, so that means I, I just need a few points, right? First, I'm gonna check k of three, and I'm gonna check uh, k of 12. Well, not first, but in the end, right? We'll say uh, possible values, right? k of three is gonna be one, k of 12 is gonna be one. And then anything underneath is gonna be any critical values I find. So to find the critical values, well, let's start with derivative, right? So k prime of x, dk dx, if you will. So that's going to be 1 minus 5 is along for the ride. And then the derivative of an ln is 1 over. So in this case, 1 times 5 gives me 5 over x minus 2. Chain rule derivative would be times one. So here's my derivative, right? This is completely simplified and everything. Okay, so we're looking for critical values. Well, you can see that I have an undefined critical value. Remember those, are, it's okay to have a, a critical value of undefined, but that's gonna happen at x equals two. And notice my domain does not include two. So technically two is not a critical value because it's not in the domain, right? I don't actually include two on this. You could sort of argue that it's a critical value because it is an asymptotic critical or, or, or value there, um, but you know, immaterial. It's not what we're looking for, right? First of all, two is not in this interval. Second of all, we're not looking for the undefined kind. We want critical values that actually are part of the flow, like the extreme values there, okay? Um, most cases, it's not going to be the, the undefined. You can have a few undefined there, like cusps and things like that. But okay, so anyway, the rest of my critical values are going to happen, right? CVs, critical values, are going to happen when that derivative is equal to zero. So 1 minus 5 over x minus 2. So I just need to solve this equation. I'll do that by adding this fraction to the other side. So that's five over X minus two. And then multiplying both sides by X minus two. Anything times one though is just itself. And then I'll add two. So I get that X is seven. Well, seven is in the interval between three and 12. Therefore, that's one more value that I need to check. But that's the only equals zero critical value. So that's the only one I do need to check. I also need k of seven. Okay, so k of three. If I plug in three, I have three minus five ln one, because three minus two is one. But ln of one is zero. So I have three minus zero. That's just three, right? Okay, k of 12, 
that's going to be 12 minus 5 ln. 12 minus 2 is 10. Okay, so 12 minus 5 ln of 10. When I punch that one up, let's see. Oh, I didn't do it on the sheet. 12 minus 5 ln 10 is 0 0.487. Okay. And lastly, K of 7. Plug in 7. I have 7 minus 5 ln. 7 minus 2 is also 5. So 7 minus 5 ln 5. Which came out to be negative 1.047. So just by looking at those we can then label which ones are the absolute minimum and the absolute maximum, right? So out of these three values, these three y values, three is the highest. So this must be the absolute maximum point at three comma three. And between 0.487 and negative 1.047, of course, negative 1.047 is lesser Therefore, this must be the minimum, which is occurring at 7, comma, negative 1.047. Right? That's my minimum value. And that's what it asks us to do, to identify uh, those two particular points. Okay? So, we can find this stuff just by knowing a few of the ins and outs and making sure that we are fitting inside of the actual theorems that we're stating, like being continuous and being closed interval. That's important. Okay, so this is the, the, the mechanical side. Go take a look at the uh, visual side in GeoGebra. Okay, next. I have the, uh, a word problem for us now. We're moving into the, the last few problems, which are just going to be a bunch of word problems now, a bunch of application word problems here. A ball is thrown upwards from the top of a building, right? So you're at the top of the building, it's tossed upwards, okay? After that, its height is gonna be measured by this particular calculation, H equals 400 plus 95T minus 16T squared. And that's gonna be in meters after T number of seconds. So in other words, T equals zero is the moment of release of the ball, okay? Now, at what time does the ball begin falling down? Because remember, we're throwing it upwards, it's gonna go, and then it's gonna turn around and start falling. Okay, so at what time does that occur? Does it change directions? Uh, how long after release does the ball hit the ground? Right, so after I release it, how long could I listen for the thud? And when it does hit the ground, what is the ball's vertical velocity when it hits? How fast downward is it flying? Uh, when it hits that ground, okay? And I say particularly vertical velocity because we're only measuring height with time here. We didn't say anything about any forward or backward motion of any kind, so we don't have enough information to answer anything other than just vertical velocity. If you want to do a mixture velocity, we'd have to talk about angles, and um, we'd have to actually make vectors uh, to have a really accurate uh, measurement of total velocity. And we don't have any of that information. So we're just going to do vertical velocity here. Okay, so let's start with at what time does the ball begin falling downward? Well, remember, when, uh, when something's flying up like that, right, it's going to peak out and then start falling downward. Okay, so that's going to be a horizontal tangent point. Or here's another way of looking at it. The derivative of the height would be dh dt, right? dh dt... is another way of talking about the vertical velocity. So I'll call it V. Vertical velocity, V. The amount that the height is changing with time, right? Distance over time is a, is a speed. Vertical velocity here is then measured as the derivative of this. So that's going to be 95 minus 32T. 
okay? And of course, that's gonna be measured in meters per second, right? Because H is in meters, T is in seconds. That's gonna be meters per second. So when it changes direction is when the velocity, instead of a positive, zeroes out and becomes a negative, okay? So then that means when dH dt is equal to zero. Or another way of thinking of it, a critical value, right? It's going to peak out, horizontal tangent. It has zero velocity for just a moment, and that's the moment that it then begins to fall. And of course, this is just a linear uh, solving problem here. I'm just gonna add the 32 t and divide by the 32, and I get t is 95 over 32, which is equal to, and I believe I wrote this one down for me, this did, 95 over 32 is 2.96875 seconds, right? Okay, so practically three seconds, right? In fact, three seconds would have been 96 over 32. So we're like, we're like right on top of three seconds, right? Only, only a very, very fine measurement tool would be to, able to really tell the difference there, okay? Or, or a really particularly detailed experiment would only be able to tell the difference. So practically, practically three seconds, okay? How long after release does the ball hit the ground? Okay, well, actually you could ask this question in an algebra class. We have a formula, a function basically, where h is a function of t, and I have just a question about the height related to a time. Hitting the ground is having height zero, and I just need to find the t value that goes along with that. Notice it's quadratic, so technically there are two t values that go along with that, right? What I'll be doing is I'll be solving the equation, zero is equal to 400 uh, plus 95t minus 16t squared. Since the t squared is here, um, I'm gonna be using quadratic formula also. Um, since the t squared is here, negative 16 must be my a, 95 must be the B, and 400 must be the C. I'm going to set up the quadratic formula because there's no use in trying to do anything else here. Just, you know, shoot straight for the answer, let a calculator help you. Um, that's really what it's for. That's what, for, for the more complicated number patterns here. So therefore, T is equal to, uh, I'm gonna have negative 95 plus or minus the square root of negative 95 squared minus four times negative 16 times 400 all over two times negative 16. Okay. Now to save uh, a little bit of time here, there's really nothing factorable and nothing nice about this particular calculation. It comes out yuck monster in, in the multiple thousands and we're going to do a square root of it and then add it to these things. The one thing I can tell you is that you can actually reduce these two negatives because the plus and minus here having both, taking a negative out of everything does not change the plus and minus. So I can actually divide out the negative here if you want to make it easier for you plugging into your calculator. Or if you don't, it's fine too. Another thing to notice is don't forget the double negative here actually makes this a plus. And the fact that this is squared uh, means that you don't have to worry about that negative either. Okay, just some little fine point reminders there. Um, then the two things that I uh, get from this calculation. So approximately, right, because these are nothing but uh, round off uh, weird square root numbers. I get approximately it's either 8.78 or negative 2.8. Five. Okay, now of course, having a negative time does not make any physical sense here. It's simply the math being blind to the physical world, right? Uh, I can't have something hit the ground before I throw it. 
So this, this particular time value makes no sense, but 8.78 seconds does make sense. It turns around at pretty much three seconds, right? And then at almost nine seconds, it strikes the ground then after that, okay? All right, so then finally, what is the ball's vertical velocity at this moment? This particular part of it, of course, does require slight bit of calculus and by slight bit I mean we've already done the calculus part I have a vertical velocity calculator right here where it's related to a particular time we happen to know that it hits the ground at the 8.78 um, there's actually a few other decimals past that and I used my calculator's memory so when I plug this in I actually got something you know a, a bit more accurate than if you just plug in the 8.78 but this is essentially what happened. V of the 8.78, da 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 da, right? Uh, we got is approximately, the velocity is approximately. Um, well, I'll just go ahead and put equals here. It's equal to 95 minus 32 times the 8.78, da 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 da, whatever else the decimals were. So my, my vertical velocity was approximately equal to negative 186.1. Uh, it's 0 0.77. I'll just use 0.1. And remember, this is measured in meters per second. Right? And the negative should make sense, because remember, it is falling downwards. And um, this is, of course, neglecting any sort of uh, terminal velocity. We're just assuming that um, the terminal velocity is something faster than that. It hasn't hit it yet. And, you know, negligible wind resistance and things like that. This is a, a very um, straightforward, uh, non-perturbing type of problem, right? We're just going straight for exactly the calculus behind these things. Now some related rates problems. Remember the idea behind related rates is I've got some connection between two quantities or more that are changing, and therefore I use whatever formula connects them in an implicit differentiation way to connect the different rates uh, in some sort of mathematical statement so that I can get from one to another. Uh, a lot of times in reality, some rates of change are easier to measure than others, and related rates is a way that we can measure the easy uh, um, rate of change and relate it, calculate, help us calculate the more difficult rate of change. Okay, first example, a six foot wide cylindrical drum standing upright has a hole drilled, uh, should be drilled, into the bottom causing it to drain. The liquid's height in there um, starting at 45 inches, you know, and then it's going down, and you measure the height change in the liquid. I guess you can, you know, see through the drum somewhat to see that the height is changing at 0.25 inches per second. Okay, so then calculate the liquid's rate of volume change uh, when it's at 25 inches of height. Okay, so uh, it is more difficult to measure the volume change than it is the height change. You can visually, you know, measure a height easily as it goes down and see, you know, with the stopwatch or whatever. So we're going to use that to calculate the rate of volume change here. Okay. So first things first, I need something that relates uh, the height of something in a cylindrical drum to its volume. So that would be, you know, the volume of a cylinder. Volume of a cylinder is going to be equal to pi r squared times h, right? If I have some sort of cylinder, like so, where the height, of course, is on the side and the radius is on the circular part. Um, basically, the liquid inside is going to be a cylinder, no matter what the height is, the height is going to be changing, right? It's going to just keep going down. 
as it as the liquid flows out of the bottom. So I want to do a related rates um, implicit differentiation on this equation right here, that the volume is equal to that. Okay. Now it's over time, right? Seconds. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a d over dt derivative of this formula, right? Well, derivative of v is just one, but it's going to be dv dt, right? Because there's the chain rule there. So dv dt is equal to, um, over here, pi is just a constant, so that doesn't matter. But I have R and H being multiplied there. Those are two variable quantities in a multiplication. That's a product rule. So I'm going to do pi. Derivative of R squared is 2R, right? So I'm just going to do 2 pi R. Uh, and then I leave H alone, times H. But I did a derivative of something with respect to r, so that's times dr dt, right? That's going to be my chain rule quantity there. Plus, it was a product rule, so I'm going to do derivative of the r, leave the h alone, plus now I leave the pi r squared alone times the derivative of h, of course, being 1, and then dh dt. Okay. So now I've got a, uh, a, a rate relating statement. I can relate the change in volume to a change in the radius plus some change in the height with their multiplied factors in there. Good news for us, this is not a weird cylinder. The radius is not going to change. If, you know, if, if we had canted it, we'd have to approach this very differently or if we had a cone where the radius changes, it wouldn't even be a cylinder anymore, we'd have something different. So from what we can tell right here, this piece is going to be zero. And anything times zero, of course, being zero, that's going to zero out this whole piece. So then I'm left with a single part of this calculation here. I'm going to have the change in volume that I want to measure, dv dt, is going to be equal to pi now, what's the radius here? The radius of the cylinder. Well, it's a six foot wide cylinder, which means we've got six feet all the way across here, right? So the radius, of course, would be half of that. So three squared, I'm gonna have times nine. And then dh dt, the change in height, the 0 0.25, 0 0.25. Now, of course, um, the, um, the 9 right here is 3 squared, and the 3 is in feet. So this gives me feet squared here, right? And then the 0.25 is in inches per second. Be careful here. Right? Be very careful here. Look, my units don't line up. They certainly do not. So here's what I'm going to have to do. I'm either going to have to convert these inches into feet or these feet into inches, right? It would probably be easier for me uh, to do the, um, the, the feet into inches here. So let's do that. The 9, uh, let me go ahead and put 3 squared here. Both of the 3s need to be converted, so be, be very careful here right? The, the squared is technically on the outside over here. And if I want this in inches, right? Three feet is 36. And then now it's going to be in inches squared. The 36 entirely is being squared though, right? Be sure that you're with me on that one. I converted the, the three feet into inches. So notice now when I put all of this together, I'll be in cubic inches, right? Because it'll be inches square inches times inches there, okay? My, uh, I'll be in cubic inches per second, which should make sense, right? Uh, I have a volume over a, a time, right? dv dt here. And so it's important to have these units so that you can make sure and line everything up uh, when you're doing these things, okay? Now, 
uh, I just have to do 36 squared times the 0 0.25. 0 0.25, of course, is 1 fourth. And so uh, I'll just do this as pi times 36 times 36 times a fourth. And uh, 36 times a fourth here is just 9, right? So 9 times 36 is, what, 270 and 54, so 324. So 324 pi. Uh, let's go ahead and get an approximation on that since we're going all the way with this right here. Times pi. So approximately 1017.876. So we'll just say 0.9 cubic inches per second, right? Okay, so be sure and watch your units when you're doing these things too, right? It's always those little nitpicky details that are going to get you on, uh, on a lot of these things. Okay, next, a person can see a hot air balloon flying away, right? I see it and it's moving away. They know that it's at its maximum height. Maybe they're radioing the guy, or maybe they know something about balloons that he's going to stay at the maximum height. Whatever. They know it's at the maximum height of 985 feet off the ground. And they measure an angle of elevation. Now, remember, elevation is from my horizontal up. So I've got this horizontal, which is parallel with the ground, and I'm doing this. Okay? Angle of elevation is changing at negative 2 degrees. Think about that, that makes sense. If, if he's here, right, and then he's moving away, the angle of my elevation should be decreasing the further away he moves, okay? Now it's moving at negative two degrees per minute. And they want us to know how fast is the balloon moving forward when the angle is at 37 degrees, okay? Now, what's the relationship there? Well, let's draw it out and see. That's a, that's a big thing, being able to draw these things out. So we've got the, the person on the ground, right? Uh, and we've got the ground. And we've got the balloon. So the person is seeing the balloon. And we'll call this theta right here, right? My theta is changing in the negative direction, which means the angle is closing like that. Okay, and then of course the balloon is 985 feet off of the ground. And we're going to assume that the ground is level enough that I can just call it a right angle, right? <clears throat> okay, so it moving forward, right? It's moving forward this way. That means that whatever this amount of ground is right here, let's call it X is gonna be the distance from where the person is standing to directly underneath the balloon, right? So if I start where the person is and go run straight out to where the balloon is right above me, that's X. It's moving forward, right? So the movement forward is dx dt. That's his speed forward, the change in X over time. Okay, so now we know what we're measuring. Let's look at what we have to deal with. I have a right triangle here, right? And I have the angle on this side by the P. I've got the opposite and adjacent sides labeled and important to the problem. However, I want the adjacent side to be highlighted more because that's the, the variable that I want to relate the rate to, okay? So noticing that I have opposite and adjacent, I'm thinking tangent, but I don't want the X in the denominator. I'd rather have X in the numerator. It's easier to deal with. So I'm gonna go with cotangent, okay? So X over 985, right? And remember, by making this decision, I'm now deciding to use feet, is gonna be equal to cotangent of theta here. Right? That's the cotangent of that angle. So uh, to make this even easier, I'm going to multiply it out so that x is equal to 985 cotangent theta. 
Okay, so I've now related the distance to the angle. All I need to do now is relate the rates, and that's where calculus comes in, right? I am going to take a derivative with respect to time, d over dt, of this whole equation here. And let's see what it gets me. I get dx dt is equal to, 985 is just alone for the ride. Derivative of cotangent is negative cosecant squared theta, right? And then chain rule, right? Derivative of theta, so times d theta dt. Okay, so now I have a statement relating the rates of x and theta, the, the distance and the angle there. Okay, another thing to remember, a measurement of a change of an angle, if it's being brought into a physical manifestation, needs to be thought of more like the change in an arc. Okay, be very careful. Degrees is not a good way to measure that. It is when you're, when you're using, you know, floating measurements and things that don't matter with the angle itself, like, when I'm doing the cosecant of the angle here, whether it's in radians or degrees, doesn't matter because the cosecant is going to work either way. It's just an angle. But over here, this is a physical measure of change and it's being multiplied like just a constant value. It needs to be in radians for this to be appropriate. Okay, so I have radians per second here is what this is going to be. Or, or not per second, per minute, I'm sorry per minute. <clears throat> okay, so let's keep all of that in mind. I want to know dx dt, right? That's the movement forward. Theta, the moment that I'm interested in is when theta is at 37 degrees. That theta can stay 37 degrees. I don't need to convert that one because cosecant of that or cosecant of the radian is going to give me the same value either way. But this d theta dt needs to be measured in the proper radian uh, arc type of measurement. Okay, so here we go. dx dt. Is equal to negative 985 uh, cosecant squared. Now here's the, the easier way to do this in the calculator. I'm going to divide by sine squared of 37 degrees. Your calculator can only do sine, it can't do cosecant. So I'm just gonna convert cosecant into one over sine, and of course, the 985 would then take over the numerator because it's times one. So this times d theta dt is negative two degrees per one minute, right? But I need to convert that into the proper uh, radian arc measurement. So then that's going to be pi over 180 degrees, times pi over 180 degrees. So technically, this whole piece right here, right, this is my d theta dt. Okay? So let's crunch that up. Notice I've got a double negative, right? The 2 and the 180, the degrees are going to go away. And essentially what I have here is pi over 90, right? Okay. So pi over 90 times 985. And then I'm going to divide that by the sine of 37 degrees squared. And I'm getting 94 0.933. So dx dt is approximately 94.9, and that's going to be feet per minute, right? Because I have the, um, the x, right? And the 985 is my feet measurement. Sine is unitless. Radians are unitless after I convert them, and I have the per minute. So I've got feet per minute there is my uh, dx dt forward movement. 
Let's close out with an MVT, mean value theorem. So an application of this sort just means that we're looking for whether or not the mean value theorem is satisfied, and if it is, we want to find the locations where uh, it is satisfied and what, what locations result from this particular connection. Okay, so remember the mean value theorem is all about whether or not you, you have something on a closed continuous interval, and since it's defined on the endpoints, you can have an average rate of change between a beginning and an ending, and it guarantees, therefore, that there would be some instant between the beginning and ending point where the instantaneous slope is the same as the average. That's our mean value theorem there. Okay, and that, that leads to other things like uh, relationships with average speed and then later on in calculus, the integral mean value theorem being relationships between areas and, and sizes and things like that. So, beginning mean value theorem here, let's talk about this. So, G and H right here, I put those over on the side just to give a couple of examples of we can't use the mean value theorem. And both of them are pretty much for the same reason. Okay, notice the interval. X exists from zero to pi. However, tangent is undefined at pi over two. Right, so right here, X can't be pi over two, which is contained in this interval. Okay, so not valid. We need continuity on the given interval for the mean value theorem to have meaning, pun intended. Okay, so then this one, ln of one minus two x minus two x on the interval from negative two to five. Well, let's look at the domain here, right? Remember logarithms can only handle positive values. So one minus two x would have to be strictly greater than zero, right? The thing in the logarithm would have to be. Uh, so if I solve that, that's one is greater than two x, and then I can divide both sides by two, and this is telling me that x would have to be greater than, a, I'm sorry, uh, less than a half, right? So part of this interval is not gonna be any good. X can only be less than one half, right? So everything from negative two up to, say, just under a half, right? would be a piece of the domain, but anything else after that would be no good up to the five, okay? So again, the mean value theorem is not gonna be valid here for even more of a reason than last time. We're outside of the domain of this function uh, a lot, right? Okay, so then that leaves us over here. I have a function f of x is 15 over 6 minus x. And it's on the interval from negative 2 to 3. Now, of course, the domain of f says that x can't be 6. Right? x can't be 6 here. However, 6 is not in my interval. I'm on a completely continuous interval. It's on a closed interval. The function is defined on both of the endpoints. No big deal. So. It is valid here. I can use the mean value theorem here. Let's go ahead and do that, and we're gonna find the value or values where the mean value theorem is pointing this thing out, where the instantaneous slope is the same as the average uh, rate of change, okay? So let's start with what is the average rate of change? What's the slope between the beginning and ending points, right? So to do that, I just need to do a, an old school slope, right? Old school slope is just y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. I'm just going to do that. Well, I already have my two x's, right? My two x's are 3 and negative 2. 3 minus negative 2 here. Where am I going to get my y values from? From the function, right? I'm going to plug them in to the function here. So f of 3 is 15 over 6 minus 3, 15 minus, uh, 15 over 3, I mean, uh, which is 5. So that would be my, my y value here would be 5. And then f of negative 2 would be 15 over 6 minus negative 2, 6 plus 2 is 8. 
And that's all I can do for that one, is just 15 over eight. Okay. So then, let's see right here. What we have is something with a fraction in it. So I'm gonna multiply everything by eight here to make it easier on myself. Uh, that's gonna give me 40 minus 15 over, three plus two is five, right? Times eight is 40, like this. Uh, 40 minus 15, uh, of course, would be 25 over 40. And 25 over 40 reduces to 5 eighths. Okay, so I have my slope. That's between the two endpoints. So I've got this curve, right? 15 over 6 minus x. Okay, I've got this curve, this curve piece. And between the two endpoints, the average slope, right, the secant slope that's connecting the two endpoints, the slope is 5 eighths. Now there should be some curve in between there where that slope is completely parallel, right? That's what the mean value theorem guarantees. It's, it's continuous, it's defined on both endpoints, uh, and, every, uh, and all of the other uh, pieces are satisfied for this function. So I've found the average rate of change that guarantees there's gonna be at least one point in between negative two and three where the derivative slope, the instantaneous slope, is the same as that. So to figure that out, of course, I need the derivative, right? So f prime here, f prime of x. Derivative of this. What I'm gonna do is I'm going to rewrite the function to make it easier on myself as 15 times six minus x to the negative one. I'm gonna rewrite the function like that. That way, the derivative is just a quick power rule. Uh, 15 times negative one, six minus x to the negative two. Be careful, there's a chain rule. Six minus x is inside the parentheses, the derivative of the negative x being another negative one that I would have to multiply by, okay? So my derivative f prime of x, or df dx, whichever way you wanna look at it, I'll do that, df dx is equal to negative one and negative one give me positive one. I have 15 over six minus x quantity squared. Okay, now, the derivative function is this. What I'm interested in is find any x values in the integral negative two to three where the average rate of change is the same as the instantaneous. So I'm gonna take this average rate of change, five eighths, and I'm gonna plug it into the instantaneous rate of change. So in other words, I need to solve the equation. 5 eighths is equal to 15 over six minus x quantity squared. Okay, so I'm going to do my little cross multiplication here. That's gonna give me five times six minus x quantity squared is equal to uh, eight times 15. Uh, of course, you could do the, the eight times 15, right? Being a hundred and, no, it's a hundred, right? 80 plus or 120, I mean, sorry, 120. But wait, I'm gonna divide both sides by five also to get rid of this. That makes this even easier as just an eight times three. So I have six minus x quantity squared is equal to 24. I'm gonna square root both sides. And that tells me uh, six minus x is equal to plus or minus square root of 24. Now, of course, I can reduce the square root of 24. I'm not worried about that at the moment. What I am gonna do is I'm going to um, add the x to both sides. So that's x plus or minus square root of 24. And I'm going to subtract and add. Remember, this is two separate equations technically. So if I add and subtract from both sides, I still get both answers. Six plus or minus the square root of 24 is equal to x. Now, let's see what those two values are. Six plus. Obviously, six plus the square root of 24 is gonna be too big. You can tell that already. Six is bigger than three. And if I'm adding a positive number to it, it's just gonna get bigger. 
but just so we can see what it is, 10.898, right? So six plus the square root of 24 is no good. Six plus square root of 24 is 10 point blah, 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 no good. So from here, I do know that x is gonna be equal to six minus the square root of 24 should work. Because remember, square root of 24 is just gonna be just short of five, which means this will be somewhere in the neighborhood of one point something, right? Uh, which is definitely in between negative two and three. Let's see exactly what it is. 1.1-ish. So this is definitely, uh, x is approximately 1.1. This is the, the point. Okay, so if you're looking at the graph, just on the interval from negative two to three, right, it does some, some curve between the two endpoints. If I find the point x equals 1.1 and get the tangent line, right, it will have the exact same slope as the line connecting the two endpoints of the curve. And that's what the mean value theorem guaranteed, that if you have a function that is continuous and defined on the endpoints of a particular closed interval, then you will be able to find at least one point, one x value in between those two endpoints where the instantaneous rate of change, right, is equal to the average slope. The 5 8 slope is for both of them, okay? So on your way out, take a look at what this looks like in GeoGebra. I'll show you the graph and the, and the two lines. And um, don't forget that these problems are merely examples. Don't focus too much on just the individual problems themselves. Make sure that you're extrapolating the generic skills to build these ideas. And uh, good luck uh, on studying for your test. Not that I think you need luck, but always a good thing to say, right? Uh, I hope these problems have helped you uh, in endeavoring to do well on your test. So here's that function, y equals 15 over 6 minus x. As you can see, it's one of those functions I like to call baseball functions. It's a, a split over a vertical asymptote at the value x equals 6. But of course, in this particular problem, we weren't interested in the whole function. We were only interested in the interval from negative 2 to 3. So what, what we need to notice is that those two points are here and here. So I'm really only interested in this portion of the curve between those two points there. So let's zoom in and take a look at just that curve set. From negative 2 to 3, right there. Okay, so we're only interested in this piece of the curve, not even in the, the whole entire curve. And what we first need to notice is that if I connect the two endpoints A and B with a segment, notice I actually have it calculating the slope of that segment is 0.625, which is 5 eighths. Of course, then I take the derivative and the, the number that we found, the 6 minus the square root of 24, when I plug that into the derivative, notice it does actually give the same slope value. The point C that we calculated, which is at the, the 6 minus the square root of 24 for the x value, right, 1.1-ish, one you know, one as you can see it is that x value, is right here. And if I, I tell it to calculate the tangent of the function at that point, you can see that the tangent line is completely parallel with that particular secant segment there. So this is exactly what the mean value theorem is trying to get a point uh, across to us. If you have a point A and B that are endpoints on a continuous closed interval on a function, you will have at least one point where the tangent line is going to be parallel to that secant segment connecting the endpoints. At least one.